So our next panel is um, going to focus on how DSRP and the agent-based approach, which you already heard about earlier this morning, can be used to look at organizational capacity and leadership. Uh, it's made up of three stellar students. James and Rebecca are current Cornell uh, University MPA graduate fellows who are also STML certificate students. And Alexis is an equally impressive graduate fellow who is going to receive her master's of regional development. All three of them are about to receive their degrees in I think like 10 days or 20 days, something like that. So that's fantastic. The three of them are going to explore or share their insights into the relationship between organizational change and culture, wicked problems in philanthropy, which is Rebecca, of course, and capacity building as a vehicle for economic development. So without further delay, I'm going to hand you over to these fabulous minds and have you uh, get started, James. All right, I want to see my screen. Yes. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you, Laura, and good afternoon. Uh, so my name is James Bond. Uh, I am currently a master's of public administration student uh, at the Brooks School. So in addition to that, uh, I serve as an officer in the United States Army. And I mentioned that today because what I am sharing with you has been actually born out of my military experience in zero sum or irreconcilable situations. Uh, today, I'm going to propose a new way of understanding and approaching organizational change when there are two opposing mental models. So first, we'll lay a foundation by looking at organizations and organizational change from a systems leadership perspective. Then we'll look at what happens when you have two opposing organizational cultures. So how do you create organizational change when you're in competition? So I present a new model to look at these situations called the culture competition graph. And we will then look at the underlying assumptions and recommendations on how to operate in these situations. All right, so before we can begin to explore conflicts and, uh, sorry, cultures and conflict, we need to have a common understanding of organizations and systems leadership. Every organization is a complex adaptive system. That means that an organization has individual agents that follow simple rules, which produce the emergent organizational behavior. So systems leadership, which is rooted in systems thinking, identifies the four simple rules of every organization, vision, mission, capacity, and learning. So we will take a minute to look at each of these individually. But if you do wanna know more, I suggest you take a look at Drs. Laura and Derek Cabrera's book, Flock, not clock, uh, which discusses these concepts in depth. So the first is vision. This is defined as the desired future end state or goal. It describes what the world will look like when the organization has fulfilled its purpose. Next is mission. These are the repeatable actions that bring about the vision. If we do these things over and over, we will eventually reach our desired end state. Then is capacity. These are the systems that provide readiness to execute the mission. And then learning. This is the continuous improvement of systems of capacity based on the feedback from the external environment. Understanding these rules gives leaders the power to not only understand the emergent properties of their organization, but it also unlocks the opportunity to create change within that organization. So together, these four simple rules of VMCL create a mental model of the organization and its purpose, and a shared mental model creates organizational culture. Therefore, to bring about change in an organization, a systems leader must incrementally change the individual's mental model to the shared mental model of the organization. And we can visualize this organizational change using the Cabrera's culture building graph. So the culture building graph is a method of understanding members of an organization and their level of support for the organizational's VMCL, organization's VMCL. And it gives direction for how to respond to each group. So your thought leaders have already bought in to the VMCL. Uh, they, you just need to love them and let them do their thing. Adopters are committed to the VMCL, but they may need incentives. 
And then you have the fence sitters and the naysayers, which compose the detractors of the organization. So it's the leader's goal in that instance to help them see the vision and mission and align those individuals' mental models with the organization's VMCL. However, this is internal to an organization. So I pose this question. What happens when you have two organizations with opposing VMCLs? What happens when they come into conflict? So think politics or religion and even warfare, where there are two opposing mental models and where the desired future end states are completely incompatible. So I must emphasize that this is rare and a very unfortunate situation. It becomes a zero sum game. We don't want this ever to happen, but the reality is, is that it does. So this is where I propose that the culture building graph can be expanded to model and understand and engage parties that are at conflict between organizations. So like the culture building graph, this is the culture competition graph, and it can provide a visual, visualization of how people are arrayed between two opposing views. We're gonna call them VMCL1 and VMCL2. As we've discussed, an organization tries to build culture by aligning mental models within the confines of the organization. However, when two organizations, groups, or ideologies are in conflict, they are fundamentally competing for the mental models of those caught between the two visions. One organization is building while the other is being destroyed. So the key differences are the following. The majority of people will be in the middle of the two mental models. They will be either closer to VMCL1 or two, but they are willing to accept either depending on the situation and what benefits them the most at the time. Second, the leaders are the zealots and the adopters have too much invested to lose. They comprise the opposing VMCL's naysayers. And last, both leaders and adopters are actively trying to move the fence sitters in the middle to their side. So there are a few assumptions underlying this model. First is this is a snapshot of a dynamic system. Systems leaders, systems thinkers know that it is critical to constantly check the mental model with reality and receive continuous feedback. This must be an inherent part of the organizational learning system. Second, this is a binary representation of a non-binary system. In this graph, there is VMCL one and two, but it doesn't account for three and four, but this is why an in-depth understanding of complex adaptive systems and systems thinking is foundational to actually utilizing either the culture building graph or the culture competition graph. Though it is binary, it can still be utilized to array the groups and respond accordingly. The final assumption is that VMCL1 and 2 cannot be reconciled. They can never be brought into alignment. They must be so opposed that there is no common ground between desired future end states. There's no compatible mental models that share VMCL1 and VMCL2. And as I stated before, this is rare and it is difficult, but it does happen. And when it happens, it's serious. So how does a systems leader approach this situation? In order to move VMCL1 or two towards its vision, leaders have to exceed the momentum of the opponent. The following are my recommendations on how to approach the fence sitters. Recommendation zero. This is, the I call it recommendation zero because every other recommendation actually balances on this one. It is intertwined into each of the recommendations. Every action or inaction a leader takes will incrementally move agents towards VMCO one or two. Therefore, each action is a risk and it must be taken seriously and mitigated. Recommendation one is love and loose the leaders. So I use an image of a pit bull here because your thought leaders should be like a dog after a big steak. You want your visionary leaders to be that ravenous for the VMCL. That if you have to do anything, it's just to rein them in just a little bit. But for the most part, you just let them get after it. Second is capturing the competition. Naysayers are not immovable. While not a lot of energy should be spent on attempting to convert a naysayer, it is possible for one to become an adopter or even a thought leader for the opposing vision. Think of a Christian missionary uh, converting to Islam or vice versa, or a double agent. These examples can have devastating effects. 
Third recommendation is to kick the fence. So fence sitters can often become content and complacent sitting between VMCL one and two, and it can become difficult to convince them to one or the other. Now, every once in a while, systems leaders need to take a swift kick at the fence. They need to shake things up to force the fence sitters to choose a side. It's the for us or against us mentality. The goal is to kick the fence at the right time where a VMCL one leader can kick it and get enough fence sitters to fall towards their side. Lastly, the cultural change that the culture competition graph depicts is truly a war of attrition. It is about outlasting an opponent. This is why many of the previous recommendations are actually about matching or balancing the opposing VMCL. Time and culture move slowly until it doesn't. And the key is to have the organizational learning systems established that capture the right moment to act to change the mental models of the fence sitters. So just to review what we discussed today, the culture competition graph is a tangential exploration and application of the culture building graph. The culture competition graph offers leaders a new tool to understand their environment and incrementally move to their desired future end state. To move to a desired vision, leaders need to generate momentum by incrementally convincing others to share their mental model. They can do this through four recommendations, love and loose their leaders, capturing the competition, kicking the fence, and having patience and perseverance. But all of this is while considering and mitigating the risk involved. And this is the way to bring about organizational change when culture is in conflict. So thank you. And next I'll be followed by my colleague, Rebecca McPettit. Thank you so much, James. I am navigating to the screen share. Can you confirm for me that you can see my screen? We can. Amazing. <laughs> check, check. All right. Well, hello, everyone. I am Rebecca McPettit. I'm currently a master's student finishing my degree in public administration at Cornell, focusing on the philanthropy sector. Today, I'm sharing with you the combination of two in-depth dives I've done, applying system thinking principles to philanthropy in the United States, first on a grand sector level approach, and then zooming into an agent-based approach applied to nonprofits. So my research builds off previous analyses of the philanthropy sector and nonprofit boards and applies systems thinking principles to gain a more thorough understanding of the structure in those systems. I do want to preface this analysis is not meant to break down every issue in the sector, but show how looking at the structure of a system can help us identify where to make interventions. Systems thinking provides a framework for analyzing the complex issues that affect foundations and nonprofits. What I've found through examining them structurally is that the hierarchies hinder impact on both macro and micro levels and replicate from the sector level into organizations. Now, when we think of philanthropy, we associate the sector's role with improving the world through funding nonprofits that do the hands-on work in bettering communities, issues, and populations. In the context of this presentation, when I refer to funders or foundations, they are charitable organizations that give money in the form of grants to nonprofits or grantees that then conduct the programs in communities. Grants are essentially a contract between foundations and nonprofits, stipulating how and when the funding is used. Now, despite having the resources and flexibility with their granting regulations to create their own structure, many foundations are constantly looping nonprofits into cycles of strict regulations around grant application guidelines, extensive project reporting mechanisms, and other restrictions on nonprofit abilities to carry out their mission activities in a community. This is a conflict between what the sector states its true role is and how it operates. And these two states of being cannot be reconciled. This is a very common criticism of the sector. And the purpose of my analysis is to look at that criticism and move beyond statements of do better philanthropy to find out why we have this misalignment in the first place and what we can do to address it. Now, DSRP and VMCL have been covered very thoroughly throughout the conference. And I also go much more thoroughly into them in my papers. So today I'm jumping right into the specific analyses and takeaways. Across both of these analyses, the philanthropy sector and an individual nonprofit, relationships, 
The R in DSRP made up of actions and reactions. Relationships are a commonality that I keep focusing in on. First, I look at the relationships between funders and grantees, and then within nonprofits themselves between the board of directors and other organization staff. If grant makers, uh, shown here in a silo as a foundation, uh, want to make greater community impact, which they do claim to desire, then a transformation in how they relate to nonprofits needs to be made. This readjustment was seen recently during the COVID-19 pandemic as funders loosened funding restrictions for nonprofits and we saw increased freedom for grantees leading to increased impact in communities. So we know it can be done and the sector has the resources to make it happen, but it keeps reverting back to the original more structured way of approaching granting. Now to look more into the complexities of the relationship between foundations and nonprofits, I used one of my favorite cognitive jigs developed by doctors Laura and Derek Cabrera called an RDS barbell. It's a relationship distinguishing system that helps us move beyond this idea relates to that idea and actually breaks out the structures within that relationship. We relate how they connect, distinguish or identify what that relationship is, and then systematize or recognize the relationship as a system by breaking it into smaller parts. As we distinguish the elements that make up the relationship between foundations and grantees, we can break it down into imposing programmatic focuses through grant guidelines with specific targets, burdensome paperwork in the application and reporting processes, having a metrics-based definition of success where nonprofits that fail or don't meet projected program targets may not receive funding the next cycle. Between grantees and foundations, we see the relationship is overall made up of getting funding through keeping foundations happy. This is just a matter of survival for nonprofits as they have to edit their focus and their projects to fit whatever funding guidelines foundations impose. We see a split between the focus of nonprofits into maintaining relationships with foundations, doing intensive paperwork and guidelines and working in the community. Ultimately, foundations are redirecting nonprofit energy to themselves and their paperwork instead of to the community, which is in conflict with both foundation and nonprofit purpose of supporting communities in need. After analyzing the complex adaptive system or the CAS of the philanthropy sector, identifying key agents and simple rules, one of the emergent outcomes that arose from the imposition of strict grant reporting requirements and having very specific project focuses for funding leads nonprofits to aligning their community work with what foundations want, not necessarily what the community needs. Now let's zoom in to a nonprofit that exists within the sector whose focus is on serving the community. So we've established that the hierarchical relationships between funders and nonprofits lead to negative outcomes in communities that foundations want to serve. This is a conflict in the stated purpose and emergent outcomes. Well, this kind of structure exists not only on a sector level, but also within organizations. The way that boards hold powerful roles that influence nonprofit operations and work inside a more structured manner instead of an impact focus leads to misdirection of energy from impact to structure. If nonprofits want to increase their community impact, then understanding how boards relate to their staff and the organization's activities is crucial. So why is that important? Well, this is the simple hierarchical structure of the nonprofit system again. And this is my blown up um, expanded out, there's just the boards portion expanded out into my systems map. The board's role in funneling the vision down through the staff and their responsibility in making big picture decisions means that their, in, in their engagement and their understanding of their roles is really crucial for impact. The elements of responsibility, accountability, engagement, and power as laid out in the center of the map play key roles in how impactful a board is in either supporting or hampering a nonprofit's impact in the community. Let's look just at engagement. As part of my systems analysis, I also mapped out how different engagement levels that boards feel with their organization and how those present in their daily activities can impact a nonprofit. An engaged board who understands their individual tasks and responsibilities and is held accountable for their level of engagement can provide expertise and most importantly, amplify impact rather than pull a nonprofit's resources away from mission activities. A disengaged board with little understanding of their roles and responsibilities is understandably unsure of where their input will matter. 
And their communication channels are siloed and they funnel just between the board and the CEO so that hands-on understanding of the mission activities is missing. A misengaged board who has energy, but it's not channeled mindfully and strategically, well, that's perhaps the worst outcome for a nonprofit. Unclear roles, in addition to misdirected enthusiasm, leads to reallocation of a nonprofit's resources from their actual work to devising simple projects that keep board members feeling involved, dealing with uninformed pushback, and ultimately, board frustration. So after analyzing the complex adaptive system of a single nonprofit, a key emergent outcome that arises is the misdirection of nonprofit energy to managing boards instead of making impact in communities. On both the macro, sector-wide level and the micro-organizational level, we're seeing that impact in communities is hampered by siloed structures, ill-defined relationships, and misdirected energy. Using structure to break down how these issues affect community impact, I was able to create recommendations for redefining relationships between foundations and grantees. There were a lot, but they boil down to a single word, trust. So you'll see that I've put trust in the same relationship line that we had as a question earlier, as the activities that make up a trusting relationship can vary. Between foundations and grantees, that trust is revealed through flexible funding, and redefining the failure of nonprofits as opportunities to learn instead of making them punitive. Flexibility allows nonprofits to pivot when needed, leading to the mutually desired outcome of helping communities. Between boards and organizations, let's make board members accountable for their level of engagement and also facilitate it through a staff member with a portion or full role totally dedicated to managing and growing the relationship between the board and the organization. When we focus on the maintenance of structures and putting emphasis on the presentation of success, whether in a sector or an organization, we divert focus from community impact to self-promotion. Splitting this focus lessens our community impact and takes us away from the purpose of a community serving sector. Embodying trust and assigning real working definitions to it is how we break down silos and amplify impact in our communities. Systems thinking gives us tools to make this kind of analysis and check whether we're doing what we say we are and also where key points of intervention are. My analysis focused on how unexamined and ill-defined relationships can replicate throughout an entire sector and within an organization. The good news is the effects of individual foundations and nonprofits making these changes can replicate outwards as well. Thank you. And I'm going to pass it on to Alexis for her presentation. All right, can everybody see my screen? Perfect. All righty, so my name is Alexis Marquez and I am a second year master of regional planning with a minor in Latin American and Caribbean studies. Today, I will be discussing capacity building as a vehicle for economic development along the Dominican Haitian border region. So looking at my research, a case study using agent-based approach or ABA to understand how modifications to the current capacity building system can improve economic development. So let's discuss the region. According to the Dominican government, the Haitian border region with the DR is made up of seven provinces. They are as follows, Dajabon, Montecristi, Elias Piñas, San Juan, Bauruco, Independencia, and Pedernales. Geographic historical context. These are three key events that bring further understanding to the social, political, and racial landscape of the Dominican Haitian border region. The first is the Haitian takeover. From 1822 to 1844, Haiti took over the Dominican Republic shortly after they gained their independence from Spain. Then was the Trujillo dictatorship from 1930 to 1961, when he established a 224 mile border in order for the execution of 30,000 Haitians residing in the DR. And most recently, La Sentencia. So a Supreme Court ruling that revoked the citizenship of the children of unauthorized migrants born in the DR between 1929 and 2010. My methodology was the agent-based approach, and this is an approach to systems understanding, problem solving, 
and analysis synthesis that utilizes a complex adaptive system perspective as a frame. As you can see, there are three key components here. The first is the DSRP analysis that we've been discussing today. So distinguishing also systems at a micro and macro level, also relationships and perspectives. Next is the Posowid and CAS analysis. So comparing the current purpose of the system and what it does to the ideal outcome, then identifying the components of the CAS and points of intervention. And lastly, a rubric is developed from the information that is produced from the previous steps that assure all recommendations do not perpetuate the current system, but support progressive desired change and, adapt and adaptable to the ways in which the CAS may develop in the future. So starting with my DSRP analysis of the system, first I developed a FROP, the framing and stopping rules, which consisted of eight core parts. Next was my goal. I, my goal was really just to understand the system and the desired outputs. Then interviews. So I was fortunate this summer to receive two grants to conduct interviews along the Dominican Haitian border region, which included international development agencies such as USAID, Peace Corps, the Inter-American Foundation, and so forth. This also included interviews with the Dominican government, as well as NGOs and CBOs whose work focused on capacity development to reduce brain drain. I also analyzed case studies and articles that focus on workforce development. As you can see here, here's my FROP, the A core parts, my influences, my goals, my purpose, the feasibility, et cetera. Then I wanted to show you a section of my map. So my map is a lot larger than this. It focused on four actors and their relationships. So the Dominican government, the private sector, the development community, and of course, residents along the Dominican Haitian border. There, this is a section of my map that analyzes development projects. And so you can see the distinction among the four parts and their relationships, which are color coded. Green are for strong pre-existing relationships. Yellow are for relationships that could go either way, need some attention. And red are relationships that need to be improved immediately. Also, you can notice that there are micro systems within this larger macro system and perspectives that are connected from the eyeballs to the dots. So my postulate, my problem statement. So economies along the Dominican-Haitian border region are predominantly agrarian and have not expanded sufficiently to meet population needs. My current postulate. So the agrarian community economic development system along the Dominican-Haitian border region is exceptionally well designed to encourage labor migration and not improve economic development in the area. My future postulate, which is the exact opposite. So it's developing a system that is exceptionally well designed to reduce labor migration and improve economic opportunity in the area. Comparing the future postulate to the current postulate, I was able to establish root differences, beginning with network governance, which takes multiple actors from various sectors to work together versus isolated development that is more siloed. Also, authentic engagement that focuses on relationship development versus ritual compliance that checks the mark of community engagement, but isn't really um, doing its purpose. Also regional community development versus profit maximizing development. And this is important to be, um, it's important because you have to be intentional about the focus of the development because it sets the values that will determine the outcomes. Also transformational relationships versus transactional relationships. So really see, really focusing on the long-term development versus the short-term, and then autonomy versus independence, finding the balance between them, and of course, theory versus practice. So in my CAS analysis, I was able to list all salient agents and determine their current simple rules, as well as current system behavior. For example, I have the Dominican government. Some simple rules that they follow is maintaining law and order, enacting and enforcing laws, provisions of basic infrastructure, et cetera. Their system level behavior is enforcing and maintaining law and order, although there is 
issues of corruption, in addition to infrastructure being prioritized in metropolitan areas versus um, agrarian communities. Here's my recommendation and rubric based off of my root differences. Um, please note that the recommendations should not violate the rubric and they are as follows. So must be system-centered approach rather than individual-centered approach, must be regional community development focused rather than profit maximizing focused, must increase or incentivize businesses to join the formal sector rather than expand or maintain the informal sector, must increase or incentivize border development rather than metropolitan areas, and must reinforce improvement of quality of life and expansion of resources slash amenities rather than maintaining the status quo. So my intervention and recommendation number one. First, conduct an analysis of current infrastructure and incentivize systems approaches that develop steering committees that address the needs of the border region by including actors such as residents, public and private sector agents, and development community to improve and increase access to amenities and the local job market. The second intervention and recommendation, so incentivize and measure cross-ministry collaborations based on sector, region, population, et cetera, to get public sector professionals to take a systems approach to their work and improve their current operations. Third intervention slash recommendation, so encourage InfoTEP, which is a government program funded by, private, by the private sector that is free to all citizens. Encourage their administration to redesign their training model to include certifications, not only from the institution, but also collaborate with actors in the development community, both domestic and abroad, to certify participants in subject matter that intersects with their technical expertise. And lastly, my intervention slash recommendation number four, incentivize and measure collective impact coalitions that create learning communities and include all actors and develop opportunities for improving practices and relationships. So why is this important? It's the people. Economic development is not possible without people and the relationships they develop to improve not only their individual lives, but also those in the communities they call home. Thank you for your time and I look forward to answering any questions. Thank you, James, Rebecca, and Alexis. Those were all wonderful talks. Um, one thing that was surfaced was that you only had 10 minutes to kind of pack in um, so much information. So we have some people who are curious to kind of know more about your backstories and maybe um, kind of the, the greater context that led you to your topics. Uh, let's start with James and just go in order, Rebecca and then Alexis. All right, yeah. Uh, yeah, I saw that question. And there is so much behind this, uh, as I said before. So uh, I'm in the military and this was really born out of one of my experiences as I learned the systems thinking, utilizing DSRP to understand a system. Uh, I wish I had known that uh, before a lot of the work I did the past few years, uh, being in some of the environments I was in we had really complex issues uh, dealing with different cultures and uh, a lot of different actors within that and trying to understand how to further, in my case, U.S. foreign policy in those areas while uh, uh, thinking about and um, understanding everybody's perspective and viewpoint on the issue. So really, mine was born out of uh, I was working in a country in southeastern Europe where uh, I was working with the uh, our partners in that country who were trying to convince some of the marginalized community um, of what their local government was doing for them. Meanwhile, there was uh, other actors who were trying to convince them to rebel against that local government. And so when the Cabreras introduced the VMCL, I'm like, that's awesome. However, I am fighting against something, not physically as metaphorically at that time, but I'm fighting against this. How do I manage this tug of war? And so they really encouraged me to, hey, well, why don't you actually explore that? Uh, so I had the opportunity to take the principles of understanding a system using DSRP and systems thinking, applying the simple rules of VMCL to an organization, and then looking at, well, how does it apply 
in a situation of conflict. I um, had worked in both grant making organizations and nonprofits as well. So before coming to Cornell had the mindset, had like the experience in both of them um, and then knew a lot of the different criticisms of the sector. And a lot of them are just, you know, I could do away with a lot of regulations. There's a lot of sweeping remarks that always bother me um, because they're not really actionable in a lot of ways. Um, so things like regulations to keep corruption low are obviously very important, but also what can we do to facilitate a nonprofit's work in the community more? Um, so VMCL was extremely helpful for me in just discussing what vision is. What is the purpose of this entire sector and getting something that everyone can agree on? Um, just really boiling it down to like, what is that simple point? Well, it is to help the world. Like, let's make it that simple. And then you incrementally work out from there into what activities make that happen? How do we facilitate that more? Um, I just found that so exciting and it really sparked my interest in basically any issue that ends up coming up with um, conflicts in the sector. I could VMCL it out and be like, okay, well, what is the, oh, distill it down into what is the purpose? What is it you want to do? And what, how can we continue moving that out and keeping um, people's agreement around that issue? Um, so that's what really inspired both of my topics. I couldn't choose just one. So I melded them together um but yeah it was a really great just like thought experiment and i just wanted actual actions to back up things instead of just being like well we should do this better um i just wanted to really break down and the structure helps us do that a lot um and i found it super helpful in that way for me um my inspiration for this topic um i am a return peace corps volunteer i served in the dominican republic in Abate, which is a community that's primarily um, Haitian immigrants and Dominican Haitians, a lot of people who were affected by um, policy that was implemented. And so working with the youth as an education literacy promoter, it really sparked my interest as far as how to tackle these kinds of complex adaptive systems, right, that are a huge challenge. Um, in addition to working for USAID as a independent contractor after my service and working with communities in the Northern border region for water security. Um, and so my first introduction to systems thinking was actually through USAID, working on whole system in the room and thinking about multi-actors and bringing them together to develop solutions that are localized and sustainable. Um, but of course, there are challenges to that, right? We have power dynamics, there's trickle down conformity because of the power dynamics. There tends to be one way communication. And so I was super excited to hear from my mentors um, that were foreign service officers tell me that they took Derek and Laura's class. And so I signed up right away to learn more about it. Thank you all for giving us a little more context. Um, I think one thing that stood out to me kind of across all of your um, talks, um, James labeled as these these fence sitters, and we also are seeing a few um, things come up in the uh, Q&A as well about, about this idea. Um, one comment I particularly liked was um, relating it back to um, Dr. Ian Cousins' uh, talk yesterday, for those of you who saw that, where he was talking about um, directions and groups and decision making. And um, I think, you know, it very closely relates to your talks about um, how do we change mental models? How do we uh, win hearts and minds? Um, so this is this is kind of to any of you, but um, curious more about like, what does this look like in practice, right? What um, in this VMCL one and two model, um, what does it look like for uh, a specific person, but also in the context of a group, as a leader, as a fence sitter, kind of thinking through the different perspectives, um, how, how might one uh, actually do that in practice? Yeah, I can I can start with that. Um, I also saw, uh, since we're dealing with fence sitters, I saw a comment about uh, kicking the fence sitters. So I will clarify, you do not kick the fence sitters, you kick the fence. That's the environment in which the fence sitter is uh, living or operating. So uh, with that, though, I, I loved uh, Dr. Ian Cousins' uh, presentation yesterday 
just because it provided some uh, legitimacy for the own things I had, my own things I had thought relating to this. Uh, one of the things he talked about is that critical point before making a decision, right? And that before that point, uh, you have increased susceptibility and you get to the point where uh, I even wrote it down. So I'm looking at it, but the brain becomes a supercomputer right before the critical point and they become hypersensitive to inputs. And this is exactly what we're talking about with organizational learning in VMCL is that you are receiving this feedback into the organizational system. And so for that leader, whether you're talking in competition or not, all of a sudden you're becoming hyper aware of what's happening in the environment and you realize now is the time to act. Now is the time to make a decision to move towards that vision. And so you're constantly doing that with, with my particular uh, presentation, you're constantly in a balancing act between two or three uh, different VMCLs uh, trying to understand when's, the, when's my turn to make a move instead of just balancing. When can I tip the scales? We often hear that. Uh, so I, I thought his presentation and relating it to some of the, uh, my own thoughts was really, really neat. You want each of us to, uh, yeah, I can hit on, I think something that really interests me with um, philanthropy and changing, like for someone to change their actions and how they approach funding, for example, from a grant maker's perspective, um, it's interesting to me that it happens. And then people revert back to imposing more funding regulations. And so it's not like that crazy of an idea to impose on the sector. Um, but I've talked to a lot of researchers say like they see these kind of cyclical patterns happen over and over again, where the regulations kind of creep back in because it makes it easier to get those reports and like the metrics to say, yes, we've succeeded. And that takes us back to what we discussed earlier today, which is um, how are we approaching definitions? If community success is like keeping bad outcomes out of a community, if it's um, doing proactive things, then you may not get that great, wonderful data statistic that we love where it's like these many people were helped in this way because it was all preventative. Um, so I think that's something that just needs is a sector wide understanding that needs to come to like some form of shared mental model to be like we need to change once again success to not be as binary and instantly gratifying in a lot of ways, um, but to kind of look at it more holistically. And that's one aspect I definitely took um, from just even presentations throughout the entire couple of days here. It's even shifted some things that I've been thinking about. Yeah, I would add, fortunately, having had the experience to implement this collective action coalitions through USAID, I do have to say that it's a, it's constant interaction of stakeholders. There are residents who don't have a lot of face time with politicians or private sector executives. So making sure that they have activities where they can set together an agenda and have opportunities for dialogue is super important. Also realizing that this kind of development is going to take a lot more time than than what we're used to. This is not an instant gratification. It's a really the long game and also changing metrics to be around relationship development and what that looks like. Um, and a lot of it too is being able to talk to stakeholders and tell them about the benefits of what it is to work in a coalition versus by themselves, because I was always told features tell, but benefits sell. And also thinking about, it's not about the best practice, but it's about the best fit. And that's what I like about the recommendations is that how they're adaptable to so many different areas and situations. Alexis, I appreciate that you brought in this, um, the importance of dialogue here, right? And like, I'm thinking about how different each of your contexts are, um, but also how the the trust and relational aspect is um, so important, but like probably manifests in, in very different ways across your different spheres. Um, I'm curious if each of you could speak to kind of um, what does trust look like in, in the space, in the context of the, the talk you gave? Rebecca, do you want to start? Yes, I can. Absolutely. I could talk about this a long time, so I will keep it short. Um, I think it also, once again, ties back into where are our priorities and where do we put our resources? 
Um, so for me, in the context of philanthropy, I think a lot of it is maintaining relationships. Trust comes from having that constant back and forth and the ability to understand you've had this past relationship with someone, you understand they'll carry out the work they say they will in a community um, instead of holding them to super rigid guidelines. Be like, you know what's best for the community. I know that you know that. And that involves putting a lot of resources into those relationships um, and devoting them away from having the uh, nonprofit in the community report back to you as much with as many um, like strict paperwork and reporting guidelines and things. Um, so for me, it really is a redirection of resources. It's reprioritizing where those are and really funneling it into those relationships and making sure that those are extremely strong, whether it's dedicating staff. We've discussed this in class before, actually at the Cabreras, and it was another um, mind blown <laughs> moment for me was if that relationship is so important, then why aren't you literally dedicating staff members to it? Um, and that's where I'll leave it. But trust for me is like that really hyper focus and direction of resources to things that matter. Yeah, I can jump in. Uh, so interesting, right? Especially when you're dealing with my background, military and uh, in conflict, sometimes like in this graph or in the culture competition is not a forced like, hey, you will adopt this VMCL. That's not organizational change at all. The whole point of this is when you're working with those fence sitters, you're trying to establish that trust through different actions and trying to get them to understand that, hey, my vision of the future is what is best for you, right? And yes, the other VMCL is probably trying to do the same thing, but there are, there are opinions that have become irreconcilable uh, as I talked about at the beginning, this is rare. This is absolutely rare that this happens. But the trust aspect is still similar in that situation where in order to create organizational change, you need to establish trust with those people that, hey, this is the vision. This is what's best for you. And I'm not going to force you to think that. I want you to think that for yourself. Because if you don't, then you're not truly adopting the vision that we have together. So really that trust is, is shared. I want to trust them. They want to trust me with that VMCL. Yeah, I would add that, you know, transparency is huge in, in trust. And especially in my case in particular, it was important for me to talk about the history because there is distrust among certain groups already. And so it's building a space where people can air out those grievances and start to repair those relationships to then build upon them and giving them that space to tell their stories and how they all fit in together. In addition, I talked about you know power structures. So also continuous communi communication throughout the process because it's gonna be a long one. <laughs> um, and to get that communication across into those fears of influence. So everyone's on the same page and that trust can start to build from there. Thank you all. Uh, I think Laura is giving me the eyes that I'm reading through Zoom that we are at time, but that was great. Thank you all so much. Thanks. That was a great session. And I apologize. I failed to mention our fantastic moderator or introduce Natasha Steinhall, who, as I said before, is one of our stellar STML certificate students. She is also, I should mention, a key leader at Cornell's intergroup dialogue project. So if that's a, a thread of things that you're interested in, Natasha is the person to contact.